this thing going. And then with that, so well, we'd like to share information on what's going on at the Deer Association, and nobody better to do that than our president and CEO, Mr. Nick Penizano. So uh, Nick, uh, turn it over to you, let you uh, share the good news of uh, what's going on here at NDA. Thank you, Kip. I appreciate that. Good to be back. I missed the last couple. I apologize, but I'm happy to be here now. Uh, you guys are talking about fall foliage. Uh, the one, the picture that is behind me, my background was taken on Monday. So uh, in my neck of the woods, things are uh, changing color pretty rapidly. Uh, so yeah, it's an exciting time of year. Good to be with everybody. Exciting topic tonight. I was uh, talking with the guys before we got started and said, I hope I can learn something here, and I'm sure that I will. Uh, so looking forward to that. Uh, just a few updates from the organization I want to tell you about. Uh, our, our third quarter branch policy update meeting is going to be held on October 18th at 7.30 Eastern time. Uh, get in touch with our man, Mike Edwards. That's mike at deerassociation.com uh, if you need the login info for that meeting. Now, this is a policy-focused meeting. It's not a, a branch procedural meeting. This is going to be focused on policy. Uh, so be sure to check that out. Uh, speaking of policies, we sent a, an action alert for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. Uh, we did that over the weekend. Hopefully many of you got that. This bipartisan legislation directs money to state wildlife agencies, our important partners there to carry out a variety of wildlife management activities uh, and specifically for at-risk species. So at the NDA here, we're certainly about deer, but we're also about broad conservation and this certainly fits the bill. Uh, you can submit us a letter of support. We'd appreciate if you do that through our advocacy center on the NDA website at deerassociation.com. We make it as easy for you as possible to do that, so please do it. Uh, we just wrapped up a recent uh, membership drive, a successful campaign with First Light, our good partners there. Uh, we raised over $25,000 for the organization and for conservation, so that was a great project. Thanks to all of you who may have participated in that. Um, we also have, right now, we have a Moultrie Delta cellular uh, trail camera sweepstakes going on. Uh, this is going to go until Tuesday, October 19th, at about uh, until midnight on October 19th. We're giving away 20 of these cameras, folks, and I personally have the Delta cameras, and I can tell you I love them, uh, and they are, they are just a great camera for the price, and even if you don't end up being a winner, go out and buy yourself a couple of these. They're great, uh, but for details, again, visit our website at deerassociation.com. Uh, you want to be on the lookout also for our holiday membership special. Uh, you'll get, uh, if you participate in that, you'll get an exclusive NDA pullover. And these things are really sweet looking. I can tell you, I don't have one yet and I'd really like to get one. So um, again, be on the lookout for that. Check out our website for details. Uh, big news on the support or uh, giving front. We received a donation from an anonymous donor recently for $180,000. Uh, this will be for over two years to support our recently announced a national initiative that we're calling Improving Access Habitat and Deer Hunting on Public Lands. And so what this project does is it leverages the needs of hunters on public lands with NDA's expertise and conservation partners, including a big one, the U.S. Forest Service. That's a very ambitious campaign, and we are hoping to directly impact more than a million acres. So we're very excited about this, uh, obviously very appreciative of our donor, but most importantly about getting conservation on the ground, which is what we're all about. So uh, that's really great news for us this year. Uh, as a staff, we just had our third quarter strategic planning update meeting. And as you're watching this, that might seem a little boring to you. Uh, I only bring this up to say that uh, when we get all the reports from the staff and everything you're doing toward our strategic plan, uh, it, is, it has been a great year. It has really been a great year. Uh, we have done a lot for deer, a lot for hunters, everything from policy all the way down to, as I just described, the on-the-ground work that we're doing. And we're very proud of that. And as we know, many organizations coming through the pandemic, um, it was tough. It was a tough time. And I'm, I'm really proud to say that we have uh, weathered that storm, hopefully a storm that's going to be ending here soon as it continues to drag on, unfortunately. Uh, and I think we're, we're even stronger than we've been really in decades. So I just wanted to make sure those of you who are members and following us, I wanted to make sure you know that because that's something we're very proud of. Uh, and finally, podcasts were mentioned at the beginning. I think it was Kip. Uh, I want to remind you, too, if you're not already listening to our podcasts, we have we actually have three of them. Now, one of them uh, was a one-time deal. It's wrapped up. That's the uh, How to Hunt Deer podcast. Matt here is on the show, was part of that uh, with Hank Forster. And so 
uh, that one is done. All those episodes are up there. And if, even if you're, maybe you're a deer hunting expert. Uh, and if you are, I'd be happy to take pointers from you as well. Uh, but at any, way, at any rate, it's good to listen to this or pass it on to potential new hunters that, that would really benefit from this information. It's really well done. Uh, and then our regular occur or reoccurring podcast, Deer Season 365, hosted by Brian Grossman, uh, who has presented on this webinar series in the past. And uh, the Coffee and Deer Show, as Kip had mentioned, hosted by myself and co-hosted by my good friend, the doctor, Mike Groman. A matter of fact, the latest episode on that one just dropped today. Uh, so those come out every other Wednesday. We, one week we do Deer Season 365. The next week we do Coffee and Deer. Uh, please be sure to check that out. And uh, we give away prizes on these, at least on, on the Coffee and Deer Show. If you're listening to this, Grossman, you better start giving away some prizes or we're going to take all your listeners. Uh, we do a, a little segment called Ask NDA Anything, and we give a hat. So far, it's been a hat uh, to, to people's questions that we pick as our favorite question, and that's a lot of fun to do, too, so be sure to check that out. So uh, with that, I know you're not here to uh, hear me tonight. I uh, look forward to hearing Dwayne's presentation. Thank you all very much for your support and for being here. It's good to see you all, and uh, let's sit back and enjoy this thing. Kip, back to you. I'll take it from there, Nick. That's oh. that's right. There's a live and well conservation on the ground, and we got lots of things happening uh, at NDA. It's a super exciting time. It's busy, but it's really good. So I get the esteemed pleasure of, of introducing our speaker. Uh, Dr. Dwayne Diefenbach is the leader of the USGS Pennsylvania Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit at Penn State University. He studied deer and deer hunting in Pennsylvania for over 20 years. Uh, Dwayne and his students have been collaborating with uh, the Pennsylvania Game Commission since 2000 on a series of research projects on deer and deer hunters. Um, his most re current research is the deer forest study, that's deer hyphen forest study, which is actually a long-term uh, study of the relationship of deer herbivory, competing vegetation and soil conditions on the forest. Uh, Duane is currently active in the Wildlife Society. He's a certified wildlife biologist. Uh, really excited to hear his presentation tonight, which is entitled, uh, how wise is conventional wisdom? How deer move during the rut and hunting season in the big woods. So, Duane, the floor is yours. If you would, please share your screen and, and we'll uh, sit back and relax and listen to your presentation and follow that up with the, the Q&A. All right, great. Thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Let's see if we can get this going. How is that? Looks good okay. from my end. Okay. All right. So uh, tonight, uh, well, it's, let's see, what is it? The middle of October. Uh, the rut is just going to start kicking in here um, uh, in, a, in a week or so or less. Um, so this is a great time to talk about uh, what I'm going to cover this evening and talking about the rut and, and then leading into the hunting season in big woods. Because our current research uh, a lot of what I'm going to show you tonight is based on the research that we started in 2013, which is looking at deer um, in the big woods habitats of, uh, of Pennsylvania. So this evening's topics, dive down a little bit, to kind of give you an outline of what I want to cover is first talk about when is the rut and how does it vary? Um, what is the October lull? Uh, buck movements during the rut, um, and we'll talk about different aspects of those buck movements and perhaps what insights that might give you towards patterning of movement. Um, deer movements during the rifle season here in uh, Pennsylvania. We have high density of hunters and, and that activity during the rifle season has definite effects on, on uh, deer movements. And, and use some of that information to share some of my thoughts on hunting big woods deer. So, uh, so let's get started here. When is the rut in Pennsylvania? And, I, and while I was thinking about this, here's some questions to, to ponder. So does the rut vary in timing across PA? For example, does it occur later in areas that have longer winters? Does the moon affect the timing of the rut? Uh, does weather, for example, above normal temperatures affect buck rutting behavior? Uh, the, can, can the sex ratio of the population affect the rut? Uh, with too few males, can the rut be extended? Um, and and uh, conversely, can more older males shorten the rut? 
um, when does the second rut occur in Pennsylvania? So that's some of the things we're gonna dive into here and not necessarily start in any specific order, but I thought where we would start was looking at moon phase because you've I've heard about this for years and years and there's been books written on moon phase and, and uh, deer behavior. Um, so, so I actually have a lot of data that was collected by the Game Commission where they check thousands of roadkill does to determine pregnancy and data conception um, from uh, 1999 through 2006. So there's eight years of data. During that time period, the full moon varied from either the 1st of November to the 26th of November. So if the moon phase has any effect on breeding, we would predict that the median date of birth, that is, or conception, the median date is where half of those uh, uh, does became pregnant, would be positively correlated with the date of the full moon. So if we plotted this out on the x axis date of the full moon, we would expect the date of conception to get later and later as the full moon is later in the month. So, so we took literally thousands, I think it was over 6,000 deer that had been road killed over those years and looked at, at uh, timing of birth. And here's the answer. The answer is there is no relationship between the timing of births or, or the, uh, or conception, same difference here, um, full moon. So you can see in this graph, um, the green dots, you can see they just bounce around the 13th of November over those eight years. And then actually what's interesting is you see that fawns get pregnant about two weeks later. And I'll come back to that in a second, but basically the bottom line is the moon provides no information about the rut. And, and I wanna get a little bit wonky here. I hope you'll just hang in with me. Um, why is that? Well, the reason is every individual wants to maximize the number of offspring that survive. And so how are deer gonna do that? How are they gonna maximize the survival of their fawns? Well, they need to give birth to their young as early as possible so that that fawn is as big as possible going into winter but not so early that it might die from a cold, wet spring weather. So there's a balancing act there. So that's the objective. Um, really the earlier a fawn is born, the bigger it is going into winter time. So gestation is about 200 days. So um, they're getting uh, pregnant. Uh, ha uh, half the does are pregnant by the 13th of November. So half the does are given birth by um, basically Memorial Day, the end of May. So how are you gonna predict what the weather is 200 days into the future, right? When I have my phone app, it's not good for more than two or three days. Well, um, the bottom line is it's day length, also called photo period. So that's what, that's what deer are keying in on is day length and that triggers breeding behavior so that those fawns are born at an optimal time in the spring. And, and how do we know this? Well, we can, people have actually done experiments. If you put lock up a doe in a barn and the only light is, is controlled by your lighting, if you set the day lengths to November day lengths, those deer will go into estrus any time of the year. Um, I mean, this has been known for a long time. And the other thing is, you know, white-tailed deer occur from South America up into Canada. And down in South America, where there is no seasonal, uh, there are no seasons, uh, the rut or breeding occurs throughout the year. So this whole seasonality and the timing of the rut all has to do with uh, uh, weather conditions and making sure fawns are born early enough so they can survive the winter. So the, the bottom line is the moon phase is not gonna help you predict spring weather. So it's not gonna give you any information about rut behavior. Now, I mentioned about 
uh, fawns being two weeks later in terms of when, when half of them are bred. And this graph uh, illustrates that. So in the blue, those are when adult females get bred. So you can see that right there around the 13th of November, about half the deer are bred. But then you get this long tail and you notice that there are a lot more uh, fawns that's represented by the reds. So there's a greater proportion of fawns. And in fact, by, um, by rifle season in uh, beginning of December, almost half of the does that are getting bred are fawns. And the reason for that is deer have to reach a critical size uh, does before they're gonna come into estrus. And um, so anyway, so that's why they're a little bit later because they're, um, they don't reach a large enough body size um, or after those adult does. So the other question I asked what was, um, can more males and more older males change the timing of the rut. Well, here in Pennsylvania, uh, we actually did a, a, had a natural experiment to test some ideas about this. And that was when Pennsylvania implement, implemented antler point restrictions. So here in 2002, before APRs were in effect, in Pennsylvania, the antler harvest was made up of 80% yearlings and 20% adults. By implementing antler restrictions, you can see that, that, that we ended up with a lot more adults. We ended up from about 20% of the harvest to about 35 or 40%. So we basically doubled the number of older males and reduced the number of younger males. And so the question, you know, we know that older mature males can cause females to come into estrus sooner. And so the question would be, if older adult males dominate the breeding, um, could more older males, or if you don't have enough, could that lead to an extended rut um, because does are not getting bred? Um, and in fact, so the prediction would that be that by implementing APRs, um, that we'd actually see a constriction in when does got pregnant. Um, and the short answer is there really was no effect. And that's because we know that even in really old age structured populations where the majority of deer are over three and a half years old, they do not dominate the breeding. The genetics work that's been done in, um, especially with Randy DeYoung at Texas A&M has shown that um, older males may have a slight advantage over those year and a half old males but almost every antler deer is breeding in the population. And so um, you really have little effect on, um, on breeding, uh, timing of breeding um, with changes in the age structure of white-tailed deer. Another thing you hear is how, oh, it got really warm and it shut down the rut. Um, and, and so we had another sort of uh, natural experiment here. Back in 2015, we had a really warm fall. Um, this line in yellow is the maximum temperatures and you can see how many peaks there were. And in fact, um, every single day from the 1st of October through the end of the year, it always got above freezing. Whereas you can see in 2013 and 2014, we had plenty of days where the temperatures were below freezing or around freezing. And so the question is, was there less movement of deer um, because of this warmer weather? Um, and in fact, you know, you might be sure early in the season there appeared to be, but in fact, um, statistically, if you look at this, um, temperature really provided little information about um, about deer movements. And, and I think the, the reason for that is if you look at movements of bucks, so you hear about during the rut, bucks are chasing does. Well, they are chasing does, but they're doing it very, very slowly. So, so on the right here is a graph that shows um, all the different speeds. So in hourly locations, so over the course of an hour, how fast was this buck going? And you can see that he never exceeded 0.8 miles per hour. Now to put that in perspective, 
if I'm on flat ground um, on a nice concrete sidewalk, um, I can stretch it out and do four miles an hour. Um, when my wife and I go for hikes in the woods in central PA, um, our map my walk says we're any we're doing two to three miles per hour. And I know when I'm in the grouse coverts, um, chasing after my dogs, I'm doing about one mile per hour. So these deer are not moving. And in fact, you know, more than half the time they're traveling under 0.1 miles per hour. So it's a steady speed, but it's a slow speed. So I really don't see how weather um, temperatures are going to affect the rut because females are in estrus. Males are going to be um, looking for breeding opportunities. Um, they need to deal with the weather. The other graph on the left shows the hourly speeds. And you can see that, um, you know, in what is it from about oh five to midnight uh, we've got speeds of a quarter mile per hour the highest we have seen for this deer was 0.35 miles per hour um and but throughout the evening and and daytime these deer are moving so these bucks and we'll come back to this a little bit later have some more information about their movements but they're moving slowly um this uh this rep behavior is uh, is not suppressed just because of temperatures. So, so what are the top four factors that influence rutting behavior that can be observed by hunters? Well, the number one is the females that are in estrus where you hunt. So when I said, you know, the peak of the rut is November 13th, well, and, and that it doesn't change and that that's the way it is across the state of Pennsylvania. Keep in mind that, yeah, that's an average for the state. Where you are um, may be different because if there are several females that, in, that are in estrus, you might see a lot of behavior from bucks. But if you don't, then you're not gonna see that behavior. So I really think local conditions or, or situations of the females that are in estrus is really gonna explain what you see on the ground. Um, but I would still recommend that um, if you wanna to try to hunt the peak of the rut, the best thing to do is uh, pick your vacation the first two weeks in November. Uh, so the second most, again, females in estrus where you hunt. And third, females in estrus where you hunt. I mean, that's what tells the story right there. And fourth, I might give you this, but way down the list, is again, think about this graph and notice that as, as the, after the peak of the rut, if you have an area where a lot of fawns can get pregnant, you might see some extended breeding behavior. But for example, in Pennsylvania, the northern half of the state, almost none of our fawns get pregnant. Um, I think out of 3,500, uh, yearling females that were checked, um, 50 of them were pregnant from Northern Pennsylvania. So essentially that doesn't occur, but in Southern Pennsylvania, in some of our management units, up to half the fawns can get pregnant. Um, and so you may see an extended rut behavior, um, you know, going into later November and early December. Okay, so back to these questions. All right, so does Pennsylvania, I didn't address that directly, but no, it does not. Um, the timing in, in Pennsylvania is the same. So the answer there is no. Does the moon affect the timing of the rut? No. Does weather affect buck riding behavior? No. Can the sex ratio affect the rut? No. With too few males, is it extended? No. Can more older males shorten a rut? No. And when does the second rut occur in Pennsylvania? Well, it doesn't. You saw that graph. Um, if there is a second rut, so to speak, you're really probably just seeing a lot of fawns that are hitting that body size that can then go into estrus and be bred. All right, so, so that's about the rut. Let's switch a little bit here and talk about the October lull. Um, to be honest with you, I had never heard of this until a few years ago. 
And I was wondering where, where does this idea of an October low come from? Well, if you look at the number of deer that are reported harvest here in Pennsylvania, um, when you harvest your deer, you're supposed to report it to the agency. And so this really gives you an idea of when the harvest is occurring during that archery season. And you'll notice that we have uh, a lot of deer harvested, then it drops off and then it slowly picks up. And so you might say, well, yeah, there could be an October lull. But look at this and think about this a little more carefully, except for this first Monday, during each week, the highest kill occurs on a Saturday. All right, I don't think the deer know the difference between a Friday and Saturday, but I certainly do because I don't have to go to work on a Friday, but, or I do have to go to work on a Friday, but not a Saturday. So I really think if you, if, People have used this graph to make an argument there's an October lull. They're, what they're missing is hunter effort. And, um, and really what we're seeing is that there's a lot of hunter effort at the beginning of the season. And as that season picks up and you know these last two weeks, right? This is where the rut is really going gangbusters and you see a lot of participation and a lot more activity. And if you're sitting in your tree stand, Right With the rut, if you're sitting in one place and you have all these males moving where their home range is doubling in size, you're gonna see a lot more deer sitting in one place in early November, more so than early October. If we look at home range size of our bucks um, during the same time period, you can see that home range size is just steadily increasing um, as, through time. So, you know, this is uh, September, um, early October, then the rut cups comes in. So there's just a steady increase. So there's nothing in the movement or data of deer to suggest there's a lull. Um, I do think that um, you get years like this year, um, we have a lot of acorns in our area and the deer aren't showing up in the, in the soybean fields. Um, instead, I, I watch them for 15 minutes eating acorns in front of my camera. So, um, you know, there, there certainly could be reduced movement this time of year because in early October, the rut hasn't kicked in. A lot of these deer are gonna be eating as much as they can to put on fat for winter. Um, so um, there isn't so much a lull as the, uh, as the rut hasn't kicked in. Uh, all right, so let's switch gears here a little bit more and talk about movements during the rut. And I want to cover home range size, talk a little bit into detail, get into detail about their movements, talk about shifts in home range locations, and then see if any of this can give us some insights into how you might pattern a buck. First thing I want to mention is that landscape context um, can play a big part. And again, you know, I'm just talking about Pennsylvania deer, but just within Pennsylvania, if you have a highly fragmented landscape, this area is a snapshot uh, near Gettysburg where I did some research in the early 2000s. In this area, a female home range might be a quarter square mile. And males might have a home range of about three quarters of a square mile. In the big woods, where you just have contiguous forest. I mean, there may be some fragmentation in the sense that some of the forests have been harvested and they're regenerating and some might be 60, 80, 100 year old forests, but it's still, it's just contiguous forest. You find there that females have a home range of about one square mile and males um, about two square miles. So you notice that males have about twice the home range size of females. Um, but landscape context does matter. And, and again, for most of my talk, I'm going to be talking about deer in these uh, large tracts of just contiguous forest. Again, going back to this idea of slow and steady wins the race. Again, as I mentioned, during the rut, these deer are not moving fast. Most of the time, they're going less than 0.2 miles per hour. Rarely do they go over one mile an hour. And then you can see this graph on the right. So we're starting in late October. So this is the beginning of the rut. 
through um, about Thanksgiving, which is when our rut basically is over. Um, and you, this graph just shows, shows the cumulative distance that this deer traveled. And you can see that it's a pretty much just a steady pace throughout the whole rut. I mean, the peak here in, in mid-November, it's a little bit steeper. So that means he, he's walking a little bit faster, but boy, it's just steady, um, slow and steady. Um, and slow and steady wins the race, right? We all know the story of the tortoise and the hare. So um, let's, I think it's great that with the technology we have today that we can look at this, um, you know, in, in two dimensional space. And so I just wanna show you this movie I made of this buck's movement. So we're, we're beginning here in late October. Um, this is in the Ridge and Valley region of, of Pennsylvania. Again, all of this is forested where we have these long linear ridges um, there's a stream down here. This is about a thousand foot elevation. Um, this ridge here is about 2000 feet in elevation. And so this guy is just going up and over these ridges, um, searching for females. There's a road that comes up the stream, up this little gap and on out. And then there's another road that comes up here and around this point. Um, and you can see the speeds here are really low, um, you know, 0 0.009, that's basically resting. That's probably just measurement error in our location. Um, and then, but again, 0 0.05, 0 0.17, 0 0.19, rarely above 0.2 miles per hour. So you can see here, he's now covered by um, early November, about 20 miles and covered a cumulative elevation of about four miles going up and over these ridges. And I'm gonna skip ahead here a little bit. So here we are, uh, you know, right after the peak of the rut. And you can see now he's covered 68 miles over 11 miles in elevation. And, it, and if you guys ever wanna watch the full movie, um, I'll give you the link, but you just search on our website, 12783, and, and one of our blog posts that has this, you can watch this full movie. Um, but again, here we are, I'm just gonna skip ahead towards the end of the end of the rut here. So this guy's covered over hundred miles, over 16 miles in, in elevation. And basically he's just moving slowly, constantly across the landscape, looking for breeding opportunities. All right, oftentimes you hear, um, and I've certainly seen it on my game camera, we're watching a beautiful buck and then it's like, where did he go? Well, um, uh, sometimes they just get up and move and go to a new place. And this is an example of a buck. Uh, again, this is in the Ridge and Valley region, um, um, but they do the same, you know, it's, this is not, this is sort of the exception, but it does happen. But this dark um, blue blob here, that's his summer home range. And then in late October, he heads to the west. And this is where he spends um, the breeding season. And then at the end of the breeding season, he goes back. In fact, this, this year, and I think this is 2015, um, we get locations every 20 minutes on our bucks. And so the first day of buck season, he said, forget it, I'm leaving um, my bachelor pad here. And you can see every 20 minutes, we got his locations and he went back to his summer home range where he's, well, winter and summer home range where he spent the rest of the winter. So if you have this buck that you've been watching on your game camera and he disappears, sometimes they just completely shift their home range and spend their time somewhere else breeding. Um, yeah, so here's a here, series of videos I wanted to show you guys um, of another buck who does the same thing. So here's a guy in September. Um, his home range is really small. This is under, under a square mile. Um, so this is on the small side for, um, for a buck. And, uh, and so you can see he's just bopping around. This is September. I'm going to skip ahead here. Uh, late September, 
um, all, all the way towards the end of September. And then you can already guess what's going to happen here. This is that yellow square where he was in September. And now the middle of October, watch what happens. All right. So now he's, he's ready. It's getting in late October. The rut is going to start. He decides this is where his home range is going to be during the breeding season. And then I've got one more. Clip, you can see the blue. So the yellow outline is where he started. This red um, is that October. And now we're into early November and the peak of the rut. You can see that this is where he's going to spend his time during the breeding season. All right, so we've covered a lot about what deer do. How might you pattern a buck? So the data I've been showing you, all of our bucks that we collar on the deer forest study are at least two and a half years old. Um, this is actually a video of one of the bucks um, that we got that's radio collared right now. Um, pretty amazing deer. He, we know that he is at least six and a half years old because, and I'll let you watch that again. We know he's at least six and a half years old because we caught him as a year and a half old deer, but we only put a uh, ear tags in. But this past winter we caught him again. And so this fall, he's at least six and a half. So how what do we know that we might be able to pattern this guy? Well, first of all, from our data, we know that there are physical features on the on the landscape that serve as home range boundaries. So this buck here on the left, you notice how this road and this stream sort of serve as a boundary for this guy's movements. Here's another example on the right. You can see this is a, a power line or a pipeline coming down through. And that deer, it might go up and down the pipeline, but it's keeping its home range to the eastern side of it. So those, you know, those, if you're in September, early October, and you find a buck, if you put out a series of cameras, you might be able to figure out, well, which side of the road does he spend most of his time? And that might give you insights in terms of um, where is his core home range located. But I can tell you that's not always gonna work. So here's that same pipeline. And look, here's a buck where his home range is just smack dab right over the middle of that. So, you know, there are always exceptions, but a lot of the deer that we see, um, there are physical features like streams and roads and topography that will help sort of set the boundaries of their home range. And again, in these big woods, you can figure that, you know, a male outside the breeding season, his home range is going to be about a square mile in size. Um, you know, I showed you that example of a buck who actually shifted his home range. Most deer just expand it. So here's on the left, this is a buck. Um, you can see in, um, in the summertime, uh, August, September, this is his home range. Um, take a look at this road. See this T intersection here in this road? That's the same place on the right, right here. And you can see what this guy is doing is his, his home range is just expanding. So he still has that core area. But now during the rut, he is everywhere. And, and, and home range size on average is gonna double during the rut. But man, some of these bucks have home ranges that go from one square mile to three, four, five, even six square miles in size. So, um, so, so to pattern that guy is really tough. I mean, you know, thousands of acres um, to go from something maybe 600 acres to, you know, to several thousand acres, it's going to be tough. So, so with this info, how would you pattern a buck? Well, I think one thing is if you could find his core home range prior to the rut, um, that might be a start. 
Um, if you hunt archery in season in the rut, I would say pray that he sticks around, right? Because A, he could, you know, a small percentage actually shift their home range, but all of them are going to expand their home range. So, you know, the odds of you seeing him are going to be much smaller because he's covering a much larger area. And then if he does survive to the rifle season, if he survives the rut and archery season and then he's alive in the hunting season, he's going to be back in his core area. And so that might give you an edge. Um, but really, um, I would say always keep your fingers crossed because looking at all these radio collared deer and their movements, um, I find it really tough to find any patterns that I could use to give me an advantage during the hunting season. Um, so, so let's, let's go ahead now to the rifle season and let me show you this movie of our most famous deer. Um, you'll have to go to the blog, but if you probably, if you Google buck eight, nine, one, seven, this would probably come up his story, but this area here, there's a road down here and there's a road up here along the stream. And so we're talking, um, uh, over a mile from one road to the other. And so what happens is um, early in the morning, as all, all the hunters are driving out here, this guy runs up to this ridge top and spends all day long just poking around or even resting on the ridge top. And then you'll see late in the day or in the evening, he'll head down. That's actually during the daytime. Um, but the general pattern is during the day, he runs up to this hiding spot. And I've noticed a lot of our bucks do this. And, they're, and the characteristic is it's on the edge of a ridge. Um, if prevailing winds are from the west, um, they can scent anything. If they dive off this slope, which is extremely steep, um, you know, they're a quarter mile away in, in no time. Um, so, so these are the kind of spots that they hang out. And so here's a couple of other examples. This deer on the left, um, his home range, this is actually private land, but where he hangs out is um, up here on public land again. Right, right on this ridge line where he can jump off that ridge if something disturbs him. Um, this is in the Ridge and Valley region. Here's another example up in our Allegheny Plateau in our northern study areas. Um, this guy, this is where he hides out during the day. Um, again, prevailing wind from the west, steep slope to the east. Um, another way to look at these data is look at their location. So the yellow dots here are their daytime locations and the, um, and the black dots are at night. So, you know, you noticed a pattern here, how they hang out on these ridges. Um, and this is the same deer in two different years. Um, but some of these spots are like right next to the road. Um, and they, they deer have just learned that I'm in a spot where I'm not going to get disturbed. So going back to this buck 8917, eight, how would I hunt him? Well, um, I think what I would do is I would probably haul a climbing tree stand up be well before the hunting season, not the day before. Um, because we see a lot of our deer um, in Pennsylvania. Traditionally, the hunting season has started on Monday. That's changed recently. But everyone, you know, would go to camp on Saturday. Sunday, everyone would go out and put up their tree stands or figure out where they're going to hunt. And I can tell you by Monday morning, they knew what was coming and were already well in their hiding place well before daylight. So, so I would... I would climb up to this ridge top here, um, get my tree stand set up, and then um, yeah, choose somewhere along this on the edge on the lip of this where right before it drops off and set up a climbing stand. 
you're not going to get there before daylight because it's going to take you an hour and a half just to hike up here. Um, so just plan on being able to hunt them all day. Um, you can't walk there in the dark. It's just too steep and too difficult. Um, you're going to pack your clothes um, and you're going to try and stay awake all day long after hiking up, you know, from maybe 1200 feet up to maybe 2000 feet. Um, and then you're going to have to leave around 3.30 in the afternoon because I can tell you, you'll break your neck if you try and get out of there before, it, um, if you wait until after dark. So that's one strategy. I think other people that have read the blog um, that have been successful have suggested that type of approach might work. It's a lot of work. Um, I, I agree that there are probably a lot more deer and a lot easier places to hunt them. Um, but that's why on our there's four and a half, five and a half, six and a half old deer are not uncommon um, because they have these hiding spots that they can take advantage of. So um, I hope I dispelled a few myths. I hope I shared some information. Um, if you want more information about the research that I'm doing, you need to go to um, deer.psu.edu. Um, we have a blog. Um, all the papers and information that I've shared with you tonight, um, a lot of that is there. Um, and we're also on Twitter, and that's our Twitter handle is WTD Research. So thank you much. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you learned something and looking forward to some questions. Great job, Dwayne. Really, really well done. Um, you know, one of the cool things is obviously you have do some tremendous research, um, but you know, nobody has the, the maps like you have, the movement data. Um, so really, really cool. Uh, we got a bunch of questions here. First though, uh, the blog that Dwayne is talking about, excellent, excellent blog. He and his staff do an incredible job engaging hunters and engaging the public. Um, I'm subscribed to it. I put the link in the chat here. So uh, folks want to go and see that and grab that. I highly recommend that you do. It's great information. It's timely information. And it's stuff uh, that's going to teach you more about deer and habitat and, uh, and can help make you a better hunter. So uh, anyway, I strongly encourage that. Um, Matt, we have a bunch of questions here. We did have one first one relative to just fawn weights. Um, quickly, uh, fawns essentially reach 70 to 80 pounds. They're going to hit sexual maturity that first year and breed. Obviously, the, the weight difference kind of depends on what part of the region that they're in, but uh, that's, a, that's a range for that anyway. Um, now, Duane, we have a bunch here. Uh, Matt and I will go through and uh, start uh, these. Matt, I'll begin, and then uh, you take the second one. So Dwayne, uh, first question says, typically it seems like the first couple of hours of daylight during peak rot are very slow in terms of buck activity. What does your research show? Well, I think, um, you know, deer still, well, during the rut, um, those bucks are moving 24 seven, but that one graph I showed you looking at average speed, you can see that they're, they're traveling the most from probably four or five in the afternoon till about 11 midnight at night is when they're probably traveling the most. So I would say, yes, they're probably more likely to be resting in the morning um, based on the data that we've seen. Um, and, you know, unfortunately those buggers are most active after legal hunting hours, but you're gonna have to try and catch them at that four, mm -hmm. five, six o'clock in the evening uh, time period. Um, yeah, I always see my biggest bucks on my cameras at one o'clock in the morning, so it doesn't do me any good. That's how it always goes. What's, uh, what's your definition of big woods? Uh, you know, what, how fragmented does it need to be to be considered big woods? That's the question we got. Yeah, so um, in Northern Pennsylvania, we're basically 95% um, forested. In central Pennsylvania, we have these long forested ridges. And then in the valleys, um, you know, that's where the farming and development is located. And in that area, you've got maybe, you know, 50% forest, 50% non-forest. And, and deer in those two areas are very similar in terms of size of home range. When you, when you get more fragmentation, like um, if you're familiar with 
Western PA, like um, uh, Armstrong County, where you've got almost equal patches of woods and fields, um, then home ranges really go down in size. And then Gettysburg is highly fragmented where, you know, the majority of the landscape is, is farmland and there's little woodlots. That's where you see, that's where I see the smallest home range. But, you know, that's Pennsylvania. I'm just, you know, mm -hmm. deer occur, like I said, from Canada to South America. So it all depends on the context of where they are. But in talking about Pennsylvania, I would say any place where you've got over 50% forest, where there are large tracts of thousands of acres of forest, um, then we're talking big woods. Perfect. Kip, you can take the next one. All right, ecology question, Dwayne. Uh, how does the presence of mature bucks cause does to come into estrus earlier? Um, so that's a good question. I don't know, but there's um, way it was, I think it was Ozaga or Verm did that research way back in the 70s where they put bucks um, in close proximity to females and could actually um, uh, stimulate uh, females coming into estrus. So there must be some sort of hormone communication that works that way. Next question. Uh, we have a, a ratio question. Um, is there a peak ratio of older to younger bucks uh, that produces the best chance of, of uh, survival for fawns is, is in essence what they're asking. So I think that comes along with the APR study um, and looking yeah. that shift over time. Yeah, I don't think it matters. Um, so we studied fawn survival um, when we had 80% of our harvest was uh, yearling males. And we studied fawn survival when it was, you know, 20, we only had 20% of the population was a two and a half and older. And we studied fawn survival when it was, um, you know, 40, 35, 40% of the population was two and a half older males. And we saw no difference in fawn survival. So I really, white-tailed deer are just so adaptable and their, their behavior is such that um, I don't think uh, uh, male sex age ratios are important at all. Uh, I, you know, other species that that could very well be different, but you know, for white-tailed deer, it's not important. Perfect. Thanks. There's actually uh, the Following next question. Up on that, and yeah. Go ahead, Kip. So, so that follows with that, Dwayne. Same thing from the sex ratio. How does that impact? Uh, um, rutting behavior. So are you seeing any difference in uh, rutting behavior based on very skewed or not skewed sex ratios? So we looked, well, first of all, white-tailed deer, it's almost impossible to get beyond one male, four does for every male. I mean, you would have to be harvesting like 90% of the population to get a one to four antlered to adult female uh, sex ratio. So, um, you know, we looked at, when we implemented APRs, we looked at a lot of different things. We looked at the sex ratio of offspring. We looked at reproductive rates, um, all sorts of things and saw basically timing of births. Nothing changed when we implemented APRs and ended up with an older age structure in the male population. Perfect. Uh, we got a, a bunch of questions here. Uh, We're going to roll with good information. One more. Uh, no, go ahead, man. I was going to add something on to that because I know where J Jaden was going with that. Um, from the sex ratio part, Dwayne's exactly right. A bunch of the early QDM research referenced that, but a lot of that was from the southeastern United States where you had very, very long deer seasons and extremely high buck bag limits in very skewed adult sex ratios once you get into that hunting season. What Dwayne's saying is right, you're not getting a, a very skewed sex ratio, adult sex ratio pre-hunt. However, some of those Southeastern states, you know, when you got in and killed the, you know, the heck out of bucks and didn't shoot any antlerless deer, that's when you did get into very skewed ratios. Dwayne already mentioned those long breeding seasons that you can have in the South. So Jaden, that's where that was coming from. But uh, I mean, unfortunately, we just simply don't see that in the Northern United States. We're very fortunate. Mm. Yeah. Right, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to add that 
I mean, for deer management, that's really great news for most of the range of white-tailed deer, at least in the northern half, is that we don't have to really worry about, you know, age or sex ratios and any adverse effects on reproduction. Awesome. Uh, Duane, uh, how does hunting pressure influence the rut? This person mentioned how, how uh, it is in Pennsylvania, but curious how, what the research shows. Hunting pressure uh, influence the rut and movement. Yeah, so um, so in Pennsylvania, our rifle season is, occurs after the rut, or the it's just at the tail end of the rut. So so our our intense hunting pressure during the rifle season, when we had, you know, we used to have eight hundred thousand, and now we've got half a million people out there. Um, it's really not impacting the rut because it's pretty much over. I have not seen um, any evidence of changes in behavior related to the archery season. Um, I, I mean, I guess I could dive into that more, but when you, you look at these movies and you see those, like I showed you that buck that just ran up to that ridge, every single morning he would go to that same spot. That just doesn't happen during the archery season, but during the rifle season it does. So, you know, states like Missouri where their rifle season is in the middle of the rut, you know, that could have some impacts on deer movements, but um, that's not the case in Pennsylvania. Perfect. We got a bunch of questions here that haven't been answered. We're going to have to uh, probably close shop up because it's already eight o'clock. But before we, we do, uh, I want to give away the prize here in a second. Um, I encourage everybody and remind you, uh, if you're not a member, I see a lot of familiar names on here. Um, that are NDA members, but if you're not, please join. We have those uh, different offers that are going on right now that Nick mentioned at the beginning, um, or you could just join, um, you know, for uh, without going through one of those offers. We need members. We need your uh, involvement. We need your thoughts and support. And uh, I've been a member a long time myself. Uh, Kip, what's coming up next month? Yeah, uh, November 10th, our next webinar is uh, yours truly, Matt. You're going to have to do all the hosting that night uh, and make sure that you introduce me really good. You know, like make me sound cool. Uh, November 10th, rubs and scrapes, uh, the 411 on, on how deer communicate. So Dwayne did a great job tonight referencing you know movement data and the October law and some of that. And we're going to follow that with, hey, this is some of the ways that deer communicate during that rut and as well as the rest of the year. So uh, that's the next one. But uh, before uh, Dwayne slips out of here, um, thank you very much, Dwayne. Excellent, excellent job. Obviously, by the list of questions we have here, people were very engaged, very interested. Um, now, we, we try to be timely and, and end this right at or just after eight. So folks, uh, you know, if there's additional things there, um, you know, uh, we can try to, to help answer some of those, but certainly appreciate your uh, attention. And uh, your engagement here and uh, doing very, very well done. So uh, thank you for spending your evening with us. And uh, something you said tonight now, Matt is going to use to ask a question to, to give away the prize. So we'll see how well people were listening to you. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And if you do have a question that didn't get answered, you could just put it in uh, our Ask NDA uh, feature on our website. And one of our staff will, will, will answer it as best as we can or pass it along to Dwayne if we don't know the answer. But all right. So the prize giveaway. Tonight's prize is a National Deer Association T-shirt. Um, so we're going to send a, a t-shirt to the person that answers this correctly. As Kip mentioned at the very beginning, you're going to put this in the Q&A uh, section of the, I'm sorry, the chat. <laughs> Is that right, Kip? The chat part of the, uh, the, that's right. Let's do the chat. The chat will uh, be easier. The chat will be easier. Uh, so in the chat section, uh, first person to type this in. So Dwayne gave us lots of facts and figures. I like to stick with a number and he gave us some, uh, estimates on, home range so what is the average home range of a buck in the big woods based on his research so the answer there if you remember right it was it was about two times the size for bucks as it is for adult does and the first person that ans answered it correctly was vince uh goweski hopefully i'm pronouncing that correctly vince got it with two square miles is is the correct answer so vince we will reach out to you or you could email me at matt at deerassociation.com and we'll make sure to get you that t-shirt 
Good job. Thanks for everybody for participating and, and typing yeah. in that answer. Yeah, so folks, I hope they'll I hope they enjoyed this tonight. Um, send us some feedback, kip at deerassociation.com or matt at deerassociation.com. Let us know if you like the Wednesday night as opposed to Monday night. You know, give us some feedback on the, on the presentation tonight or other talks that you would like to see. You know, as, as we put these together, we certainly want to provide information that you're interested in and want. So uh, feel free to send us some information and uh, Matt and I'll do our best to uh, continue to provide high quality webinars for folks. So with that, Dwayne, good luck to you the rest of the season and, and to your students. Everybody else here, be safe. Make sure you're wearing a harness and using a lifeline when you're climbing. Good luck to you this deer season. And Matt, uh, good job. Uh, I'll see you tomorrow. All right, everybody. Have a good night, everybody. Thanks, Have everybody. a good night. Bye. Thanks All again, right. Dwayne. You're welcome. Bye.